not only for our caucus, but for this Congress and for this country. We cannot sit idly by in silence and watch what is happening as this devastation is continuing uh, in these communities. And so I will yield back the balance of my time and thank you one more time for allowing us to be here this evening. Thank you, Congresswoman Waters. And we want to thank you for your leadership in leading the Jobs Task Force for the CVC and for being such a strong voice for those who are continually being left out and left behind. At this time, I'd like to yield such time as he might consume to Congressman Butterfield from North Carolina. Let me thank you, Congresswoman Christensen, for all of your work, not only here in the House of Representatives, but what you do for the Congressional Black Caucus all across America. Now, what hasn't come out tonight is that you are actually the first vice chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, and you work so hard for all of us, and we want to thank you very much. We want to thank you for convening uh, this special order tonight. You work so hard to, to make it happen. I also want to extend my appreciation to Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who uh, worked so tirelessly to, to help make successful the, the tour that we had a few weeks ago. Uh, she and her staff worked so very hard, and, and I want to publicly thank them for all that they did. Uh, I had intended to, to go to two of the five events, but because of Hurricane Irene in my district, I did not make it uh, to Los Angeles, but I did go to the first one. Uh, I was there in Cleveland with Congresswoman Marsha Fudge uh, when we uh, had the, the jobs fair and the town hall meeting, and it made such a powerful impression on me. Uh, for us to get up that morning and to drive over to the community college and to see thousands of people uh, lined up trying to get an interview for a job. Uh, there was no question about it that these people were sincere. Uh, they were jobless through no fault of their own. Many of them told us that they had been jobless for more than two years, and they were standing in line hoping to get an opportunity to be interviewed by some of the fine companies uh, that had come uh, with uh, jobs in hand. And so I, I want to encourage us to continue our work. Uh, we have so much work to do. Uh, the national unemployment rate now is 9.1 percent, and African-American unemployment is at least 16.7 percent and, and probably more. Uh, as Congresswoman Waters said a few moments ago, among African-American youth, the number now approaches 50 percent, and so we have work to do. Uh, the President has announced a very bold jobs plan uh, that I hope that we can come together as a Congress, both Democrat and Republican, uh, House and Senate. I hope that we can come together and, and pass that package, the complete package, in just a few days because the American people are demanding that we do it. Uh, we have a deficit panel that has now uh, begun its work. Uh, Twelve members are equally divided between Democrats and Republicans and, and half from the Senate and half from the House. And, and we are hoping and praying that that deficit panel will be able to come together and to present bold ideas to this Congress on November 23rd and so that we can demonstrate to the American people that we are serious. We are serious about trying to create jobs. But you know, Congresswoman, we, we as a Congress cannot do this alone. We as the CBC cannot do this alone. We've got to have shared sacrifice from people all across America, and that includes America's corporations. Uh, I've been disturbed over the last few days that the reports now indicate that America's companies are sitting on more than $2 trillion in retained earnings, and, and, and that is so disappointing. And so when we talk about creation, creating jobs, American corporations have a responsibility too, to put people to work and to start spending and investing in their own companies. And so we uh, go forward now, and we have a lot of work to do. We have a short term, as, as, the, as the minority whip said a few moments ago, and he's absolutely right, and I want to thank uh, Steny Hoyer for his willingness to come to the floor uh, tonight and, and to, to, to make the statements that he made. But we must have a short term solution and a long-term solution. In the short term, we've got to create jobs, we've got to grow the economy, we've got to help businesses innovate, we've got to improve the infrastructure so that we can start getting more revenue from American workers and hopefully in the long term we can begin to pay down the deficit. So thank you for allowing me to come to the floor tonight. Thank you for your leadership. I thank the chairman of our Congressional Black Caucus who works tirelessly I don't know when he goes to Kansas City. He is uh, from Kansas City, Missouri, and a good friend of all of ours, but I don't know when he, when he rests, but he is our tireless leader. I understand that he may, may be next in the queue to speak, and I will eagerly await the, the, the statements from our chairman. So thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time.
Thank you, Congressman Butterfield. And thank you for pointing out the fact that America's corporations are sitting on billions of dollars. And they have an obligation. They can, as I understand it, they claim that there is uncertainty. And so they're holding on to their funds. But there can't be any more uncertainty around our, in our corporations than in the families around this country who are hurting because they need a job. Without question. Thank you, so, thank you uh, again, Congressman Butterfield, for joining us. At this time, I, it's my pleasure to yield to our leader of the Congressional Black Caucus, the Reverend Emmanuel Cleaver. And thank you so much for uh, your work in reminding this Congress and this country on the importance of job creation for America's families and for leading us on that tour over the August recess. I yield you as much time as you might consume. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair of the uh, CBC, uh, and uh, to follow uh, Congressman Judge uh, uh, G.K. Butterfield, uh, who I think hit on all the proper and necessary uh, areas of concern. It has been written um, that ours will be the last generation uh, in this country uh, to experience uh, surpassing the previous generation, but our children will not achieve what we have achieved, that <clears throat> the jobs are not there. And while the individuals who've written about this and presented research on it are certainly brilliant and, and wise, uh, I will gently rebuke them and disagree with uh, their prediction. I am not in any way willing to accept the fact, the fatalism, that the United States will inevitably uh, fall to number two in the world behind China. Uh, yesterday there was a news story that said, at best, there will be two superpowers equal in terms of influence and uh, their economies, uh, China and the United States. This nation that placed men on the moon, this nation that creates a new technology almost hourly, should never surrender its place in the world to any other nation. And further, I don't think that it is in our best interest to even give a hint that we believe that we can't continue to create jobs for the next generation. The jobs tour that we had during the month of August was eye-opening and earth-shattering. When we <clears throat> walked from our cars inside the Cleveland State University place where we held the jobs fair, there were people who had been in line since 5 a.m. that morning. And so it always troubles me to hear people say, with, say and, and say baselessly, well, you know, some people don't want to work. <clears throat> 5 a.m. in the morning, standing in line, and at best of the five or 6,000 people who were there, uh, we only had about 2,000 jobs. But people stood patiently in line. And one of the things that happened that I think some of you may already know about who are in the CBC, uh, an Anglo gentleman, uh, uh, and there were people from every race at, in every city. But this particular gentleman uh, caught my attention because he said, look, I listen to black radio. He said, I just like R&B. And he said, I heard about the the jobs fair, and I thought I'd come over since I'm unemployed. And he said, is it all right? And of course, our position has been, is, and shall always be uh, one of including everybody, uh, particularly in a time of crisis, but even if we were not, that's what we would want. And so he remained in line. I'm not sure what happened, whether he was one of the successful applicants or not. The point I want to make is that the pain that is being experienced in this nation is not just being experienced by African Americans. It is true that our numbers are higher. But our numbers are higher for a variety of reasons. Number one, 
African Americans historically have tried or sought employment in government. One of the reasons Washington, D.C. is predominantly black is because African Americans from the South came to Washington by the tens of thousands because it was believed that if you could get to the capital of the United States that you would experience far less bigotry and discrimination. And so by the thousands that came to Washington. The same thing holds true with government. African Americans have sought employment with state, local, and federal governments. And so every time people read in the paper or cheer that some state just laid off two or three hundred people, uh, they need to understand that those are two or three real human beings, and chances are also great that they're disproportionately minority. And so that's one of the reasons that our numbers uh, are swelling uh, like they are. Uh, but also, I think we've got to r realize that there are some other factors through no fault of people who are unemployed. I served as mayor of Kansas City, Missouri from 1991 until 1999, two terms, eight years. And one of the things we had to always fight was uh, expanding urban sprawl, is what it's called sociologically. Kansas City is a city that stretches 322 square miles. To show you how large that is, you can place the, inside, the entire city of San Francisco inside the city limits of Kansas City 30 times. Or the city of Washington, uh, I think it's like 42 times. We, we, we got, it's a huge city. Now, while many politicians brag about that, the truth of the matter is we stretched out our resources. And one of the things I learned at the, during the jobs fairs, we went, started out in Cleveland, went to Detroit, left Detroit, went to Atlanta, left Atlanta, went to Miami, left Miami, and went to Los Angeles. And there's one thing that was, in, that was uh, uh, present at all of those that, that this Congress needs to deal with, and it is this. The jobs that were brought to our fairs were not new jobs. The truth of the matter is they were jobs that already existed except they were in the suburbs. And so as the cities have expanded, the jobs have moved to the suburbs. And so we cannot speak of creating jobs without dealing with the issue of transportation. There, there's an inextricable connection between uh, jobs uh, and transportation. How do you get people in the highest uh, unemployed, uh, unemployment areas to the areas where the jobs are? And for those who live on the eastern seaboard, you have a little better situation because you have, as we do in Washington, the metro. Uh, but when you start moving toward the western part of the United States or the Caribbean, uh, there is no mass transportation that is as effective as it is on the east coast. Therefore, if, if jobs are in suburban Kansas City and people who live in the urban area are unemployed and do not have a car, and do not have any way of getting to the jobs, there is no way they can get there. And remember, Kansas City is a city of 322 square miles, which means that people, uh, you know, could, could need to go essentially uh, 30, 40, 50 miles to get a job. Now, uh, let me also say that nothing has been discussed thus far dealing with transportation. The jobs bill is seeking to have what I think most of us would support, which would be uh, some kind of um, transportation uh, bank uh, where we would end up, uh, the government would put money in and then the pro hopefully the private sector would come in uh, and, and, and we would be able to get these infrastructure jobs going. Uh, but uh, the amount of money that is being discussed is woefully inadequate and there's probably little chance that we're going to be able to create any new uh, mass transit programs uh, in the country. In fact, uh, UMTA, the Urban Mass Transit <coughs> Administration, is virtually broke. And so uh, there's very little uh, in the way of help coming forth. 
Now there's some politics involved, and, and we're all in the political environment, and the people at home may not even understand uh, what's going on. And I think, uh, tragically, I have uh, watched uh, our country uh, move to a, uh, a, a state where uh, people are constantly angry. Uh, they're being told to hate their government. Uh, and then both sides of the aisle you, you use inappropriate um, language to, to discuss things uh, uh, with the other side of the aisle. And it's continuing to ratchet up. And it's getting worse and worse. And the people around the country are not only participating in it, they are encouraging it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the United States of America. My hope and my dream is that this nation will be around for my children and my grandchildren. But I'm telling you that what our children are seeing is not a pleasant sight because they are looking at a nation that is becoming more and more divided. Uh, you can't look at, look at television or radio without this constant attack, attack, attack. Um, and it's just uh, sickening uh, to, to see this. And then as we're moving into an election cycle, uh, we're going to see thermonuclear campaigns. And the American public needs to come to grips with the fact that if people will run a nasty campaign where all they do is attack, the chances are when they come to Congress, they're going to do the same thing. And the more we put pe bring people in here who come for the sole purpose of fighting against the other side, the less business we're going to take care of for the uh, people of this country. I, t I, I said last week, there are some people who would like to defeat the President of the United States. Fine. Campaign against him. Get your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, uh, your friends, and everybody. Vote against him. And if you can vote twice, vote twice. Do everything you can to defeat the President. But right now, vote for the American public. Fight him later. Vote now for the American public. And the American public is in trouble. We've got to create opportunities for jobs to, to, to grow and develop, uh, or we're going to find ourselves uh, faced with a new normal, a new normal where unemployment is considered normal at 8% uh, rather than 3.5%, which is what, the, uh, what, what our, our predecessors decided, that we're going to keep unemployment at 3.5%. Uh, and so uh, we can't allow this to happen. I think we've got to fight against it. Uh, but more than that, what we've got to do is quit fighting each other. Nothing is going to happen worth anything if we are fighting each other. Let me conclude, uh, Congresswoman uh, Christensen, Dr. Christensen. Uh, my family makes fun of me because I like, I will. I understand we, we have a few minutes remaining, and you brought up the subject of infrastructure in, in your remarks, and that's, that's a very important conversation that we've got to have in this country. And you served eight years uh, as mayor of a major city. Would you again uh, speak to the importance of infrastructure and what it can mean to job creation and economic development in communities all across America? I'm from a rural community. I have 88 small cities and towns in my district, and they don't have access to money to, to build infrastructure. And the infrastructure bank that you made reference to it would just bring new light to rural communities. And, and I know you served as a mayor. Just talk about the relationship between infrastructure and job creation. The, the, what is generally said is that, uh, is that you get four to one jobs to money spent. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we do infrastructure projects, and that those, those jobs are long-lasting. Now, most of the infrastructure in this country is in decrepit condition. Uh, most of the stormwater sewers, uh, wastewater sewers in cities around the country are over a century old. Uh, our roads are collapsing. Our bridges are collapsing. We saw in Minnesota two years ago what happens when we neglect our own infrastructure. And the worst thing about it, Congressman Butterfield, is that we're building roads and bridges right now in Iraq. New roads and bridges and schools in Iraq right now. I'm just a dumb Methodist preacher, but something doesn't add up. We're doing all of this in Iraq, and our roads are crumbling, and we have American workers ready to do the work if we can create the opportunities. And we can yes. with the infrastructure bank. Yes. Uh, but we've got to put enough money in the bank to attract the private sector dollars. And I think that 
and that's a part of the president's plan, and we'll hopefully people will, will, will buy into it. But I don't think we have a lot of time to waste. Americans are sitting around now hoping, many of them even praying, that we will do something to help them out of the economic doldrums uh, in which they find themselves. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, share tonight uh, uh, in, in this discussion because uh, I think people around the country who are watching this uh, mm -hmm. uh, need to know at least there are some people in Washington who are looking out for their best interests. And I think based on what we're doing, we are part of it. I'm not going to suggest that other folk are not interested in helping folk. They are. I'm saying that uh, sometimes, maybe even unintentionally, we allow political ideology uh, to trump any and everything else. And at some point, we ought to be more Americans than we are Democrats or Republicans. Thank you. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Chairman Cleaver, and, and thank you for the perspective that you always bring to these discussions, uh, helping us to focus on the important issues, sometimes the underlying issues that often get overlooked. And yesterday and today, we've taken time out of our daily routines to remember the over 3,000 people who went to work on a bright sunny morning and whose lives were snuffed out in three dastardly acts of terrorism. We remembered and honored them, their families, and the first responders who rushed to help and also met their death on September 11, 2001. And we paid tribute also to the men and women of our armed forces who lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan, continuing our fight against Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, and those who are still there protecting us and the world from attack. Today I had the honor of addressing our postmasters at their annual convention and remembered Thomas Morris Jr. and Joseph Corsine who died after being exposed to anthrax, sent in the mail in the weeks after as they worked at the Brentwood, Brentwood Postal uh, Facility here in Washington. You know, we didn't look at those who died or talk about those who died as Republicans or as Democrats or Independents. And they were workers in both the public and the private sector who some groups are today trying to pit against each other. We honor them all and their families for their sacrifice. Tonight we've been focusing on the workers that remain with us, but most especially we are singling out for our attention, for the attention of this Congress and for all Americans, those who do have no job, those who have no job, and for whom until now it had appeared as though there would be no legislation to come to their aid. But thanks to our great president, there's now a bill before us, and we're calling on both bodies to pass it as soon as possible and without taking it apart. The 1.9 million jobs and the 2% economic growth projections are dependent on those two things, that we pass it promptly and that we pass it intact. And most importantly, as President Obama said, and all of us know, the American people cannot wait for 14 months until after the next election they have already been hurting too long, and they need those jobs. They need our help today. As you can see, the Congressional Black Caucus did not wait either. We felt the pain and anxieties in our communities and communities across the country and used our August recess to partner with the private sector and some government agencies to bring jobs that are needed so desperately into our communities now. People of all ages, all educational backgrounds and levels came out in the thousands everywhere that we held those job fairs. Mr. Speaker, the people of this country are crying out to us to put them back to work, to allow them to make it in America, and to be able to take care of their families and our nation once again. Sure, there are things in the President's draft bill that some of us are not particularly fond of that we're willing to accept for the integrity of the entire package and for the good of our country. On others like Social Security and Medicare, we accept the President's goals and hope that we can work with him to achieve them through any alternative measures wherever our approaches might differ. You know, the ladies in the market in the Caribbean, uh, at a home in the Virgin Islands, used to what we call marry different fruit and vegetables for sale. You had to buy the two of them, whether it was limes and peppers or yams and okra, you had to buy the two. The, the vegetables were married. The purpose of that, of course, was to get everything sold by tying something everyone wanted to something that might not be as popular. Now, I know that was not our President's approach, but he did put together a package that could best appeal to us 
so that we could all come together and buy it as a package. And so, Mr. Speaker and colleagues, that is exactly what we should and must do. Creating jobs and stimulating our economy is critical not just to our present but to our future. This is not an issue that's about the president and it ought not to be about the next election. Neither is it about the CBC or members of Congress or about Republicans or Democrats or independents. It's about the welfare and the well-being of the American people and of our country, who I know all of us care about. We are in a crisis. In crises, people always come together to the aid of each other, as we did on 9-11, 2001, and in the weeks and months after. So it's our hope and prayer that this Congress can do the same thing now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I yield back the balance of our time. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Carter, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week we were here talking about jobs. Whoa. Get a repairman in to fix this thing. This week we need to talk about jobs again. Because quite honestly, the problem the United States has is we have to get our people back to work. These fine folks had just uh, had the hour before us. So they were talking about jobs. Talking about the ability to get to your job. I, I thought it was an interesting discussion. We are all concerned about jobs, and we all have different views of how they, they should be done, this should be done. The president laid out a, a broad agenda for another stimulus bill that he believes will cause us to have new jobs. And we're gonna, he's going to deliver that, I think, today in writing so we can all sit down and look at it and analyze uh, just exactly what it actually says so we can figure out what, how much of that will create jobs and those two people, if there's a disagreement, we'll at least know what we disagree with. But the bottom line is there are some things that are basic. <coughs> people, people take their money and they invest their money when they feel like, A, it's going to make their money, and B, that it's going to be, they're going to feel, can feel relatively safe that the future that they envision is the future that's going to actually happen. You've got to look down the road in any organization and make up, get yourself a perspective of just what it takes to make your business or your operation thrive and go forward. And there's some basic things you want to know. You want to know, basically, over, let's say you're doing a five-year plan. Over the next five years, some simple things you'd like to know. What, what's, what are my taxes? What, what taxes am I going to have to pay on my business? What regulations are going to affect my business? And, and are they going to change? Where's the source of, in, uh, of money to borrow or invest in my business if I want to expand? Let's say I want to put a new assembly line in my factory, or I need a new building for my business to grow and, and put my employees in. Am I going to be able to finance that, that building? Am I going to be able to come up with the mortgage money to be able to do that? Am I, do I, can I envision a pathway to income that will support that mortgage and the paychecks of those people that I'm going to hire to run my business with me, to operate the business? These are not mind-shattering things. It's very simple stuff. If you were starting a lemonade stand, you'd have to make some kind of projection on a lemonade stand to figure out whether you were just going to sell lemonade today or maybe you could sell it all week if you're a little kid. But you've got to know what the playing field's about. And tonight, I'm going to talk about the same thing we talked about last night, something that may be unintended consequences. Uh, it may be a different agenda, a bit different view of the world, or whatever you want to call it, but there are very, very onerous regulations that are popping up now 
and on, on a basically daily basis that are surprising people in industry around the country. The one that is a front page headline and will be the subject of legislation I believe this week in Congress is on this board right here. And Congressman Tim Scott of South Carolina has a bill to block this regulation, this action by one of our uh, regulatory authorities, the National Labor Relations Board. The National Labor Relations Board has filed a complaint against Boeing to prevent them from, move, from building a new aircraft plant in South Carolina. Boeing currently has a large complex of production in Seattle, Washington, or somewhere in Washington. I think it's in Seattle. Puget Sound, it's called. <coughs> and the problem that the National Labor Relations Board has with the South Carolina site, which is not going to displace, to my knowledge, any of the union employees that are in Puget Sound, but are going to, it's a new factory with new employees, but because this factory is in a right-to-work state where a person doesn't have to join the union in order to get the salary and benefits that the company pays, the National Labor Relations Board has filed suit against Boeing to prevent them from hiring these people and opening this plant. Now, at a time with over 9% unemployment, close to 10% in some estimate, and as you heard, in some communities, the African-American community, 16 or 18 percent unemployment. The Hispanic community in the very same kind of numbers for the Hispanic community. Why would, why would a board in Washington, D.C., the National Labor Relations Board, why would they want to say to a company which has made a, a financial determination that the wise place for them to build their next factory is in the great state of South Carolina, but because they are not a union state, they say, no, we're not going to let you build it there. When did it become the government's job to, to have regulatory authorities telling people where they could and could not build a plant based solely on union membership? Uh, this is very, very onerous. It's very, very unfortunate. I, without any argument pro or con to the union membership, this state, which is a sovereign state of our, of, our, of our nation, has chosen to have right to work laws, which means you don't have to join the union to go to work. Other states choose to have union laws and close shops, and th which means that you can't work in a place unless you join the union. Whether you like one version or the other depends on where you stand. But the fact are, facts are that in this country, we have both union shops and right-to-work states. And I don't think the government should be picking winners and losers. I think it's inappropriate for the government to be picking the winners and losers. So that's why Tim Scott is bringing a bill to the floor this week, and I believe it's this week, to discuss this very issue and basically restrict the National Labor Relations Board from having the power to do something like this, because this is not appropriate. The National Labor Relations Board's job is to, to develop the, labor, the relationship between labor and management. It's not a guarantee of union membership. And that's the real, this is the, the reason we're talking about this first and foremost is this is the current event in regulations and government interference in a person's, in a, in a company's business. And by the way, what is a corporation? This is something I've, I'm always amazed. The minute you say the word Boeing Corporation, it's like they become something, some giant something, and like it's one, one rich man someplace that owns Boeing. If you own a 401k, if you have a retirement plan, if you have, uh, in, are in, in, involved in even the government investment plan that we have for our federal employees, there's a pretty good chance you might own Boeing stock. Your plan might own Boeing stock. So what is that corporation? Well, it's you. 
if you own Boeing stock, because the owners of that company are the people who own the stock. So we need to realize that it's not one or two rich people that own Boeing. It is a multitude of Americans who have invested a small part of their paycheck in buying a share or 10 shares or a million shares, whatever they can afford, of Boeing stock. So it's, you know, we got this concept that came out of the 60s of it's, don't steal from the individual, but steal from, quote, the man. In criminal law, where I spent my, most of, much of my life, that was always an amazing thing for me. The man seemed to be anybody that you didn't know. But it certainly was the corporations. And yet, an awful lot of people have their life savings invested in companies like Boeing, like Shell Oil Company, like Exxon, like United States Steel, if they still exist, I don't know whether they do or not, like Continental Airlines, like American Airlines, like Union Pacific Railroad. Those are all owned by people. People own those corporations. Why should the National Labor Relations Board tell the representatives of the people that own Boeing stock that they can't be in South Carolina because it's not a union shop? I don't think they should. I think this bill will pass out of this House and hopefully will get the support of the President and the realization by the Democrats over in the Senate that this is, a, uh, is an important thing and a very bad precedent for the government to be picking winners and losers. So we started with this board. Now, I talked about my bill that I had, and w which we may or may not take up, but this is, well, first off, let me tell you something we've been doing. The National the Congressional Review Act is in existence at this time and it allows Congress to review every federal regulation issued by the government agencies and by the passing of a joint resolution overrule those, those regulations. Federal agencies shall, that means they must, submit to each House of the Congress, that's the Senate and the House, uh, to the Comptroller general a comprehensive report on the, any major proposed rule. Congress has 60, and that's legislative days, to pass a joint resolution of disapproval of any rule. The Senate must vote on a Congressional Review Act resolution of disapproval. So there is a tool to actually disapprove of some of these, these uh, rules that we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to be using that tool. We've already started using it. We're going to continue to use it. So I'm going to put it down here at the bottom. So we remember we've got a tool. <coughs> People have asked me why I put a bill forward that would be so general as to say, let's have a general regulation moratorium on all regulations until 2013. 2013. Let me read you some, this is not an original idea by John Carter, that's me. Uh, this, is, uh, this is some regulations that come, I mean some articles out of some newspapers. Let me just read you a couple of them. The Detroit News. The flood of federal regulations coming out of the Obama administration adds costs, stifles economic growth, and limits job creation. Growth is a smarter way to generate additional taxes from businesses than raising the rates and thus, operating thus, thus the operating costs. The former approach creates jobs, the latter kills them. The business community is also warning that a flood of federal regulations will limit growth and job creation. Obama should suspend implementation of any regulation with potential impact on the economy until unemployment rate falls below 6%. The Environmental Protection Agency, in particular, must be throttled. The EPA's war on coal affects power plants that provide roughly half of the nation's electricity. In Michigan, DTE Energy says that the new rules will take 20% of its capacity offline within three years. Without an assured supply of energy, companies will not invest in new facilities. <coughs> Excuse me, that's the, that's the um, clip from the Detroit News. The Wall Street Journal, business leaders, 
quote, stop the implementation of job-destroying regulations. Many of those suggestions are familiar. The CEOs want lower corporate taxes in the U.S., which has among the highest corporate rate in the world, and a moratorium or a rollback of business regulations. The, number, the government needs to be a better partner with the business world, says Magellan, Magellan, I guess that is, Health Services CEO Renee Lear. Echoing a sentiment expressed by many, James Turley, Chairman and CEO of Ernst Young, removed go government regulation, regulatory policy, un, excuse me, removed government regulatory policy uncertainty through 2013 by halt, halting initiation or implementation of regulations when such regulations could harm jobs or economic growth. So that's just two quotes out of the newspaper. There are more here. But the point of that being is that the people who create jobs, the job creators are the small and mid-sized businesses of this world, and the big businesses for that matter. But the real generator is the small businessman in America. Over 90% of all the jobs held by anybody in this country are held by are, those people work for small businesses. Now, what's a small business? Well, the other day we had, sitting up here listening to the president's speech, we had a, a franchise holder for McDonald's franchises. McDonald's Hamburger Place is a small business as it belongs to a person who has purchased the franchise for that business. We had another man with sports clips, which is a, a sports cuts, which is a haircut franchise. And these are individual people who get a national name and a national product, and they pay money for that, for the right to use that national name and national product, and they, but they are a small business, usually run by one or two individuals. And they're telling us the uncertainty of regulatory procedures of the federal government is making their job untenable. I see I'm joined here by my good friend, Mr. Manzullo. I think he might have something to say about this. Don, would you like to, to take the mic? And I'll be glad to yield you whatever time you'd like to have concerning regulations and how they, you see them affecting folks in your part of the world. Well, thank you, Judge Carter, for the opportunity to be with you this evening. I spend, as you know, most of my time working on manufacturing issues. Our congressional district uh, in the northern part of Illinois is home to over 2,000 factories. Uh, and McHenry County, in particular, uh, is home to uh, some of the most high-tech uh, plastic companies in the world. The uh, president uh, last week spoke before Congress and talked about regulations, and he said that every rule should meet the so-called common sense test. Uh, regulation should protect people from environmental health hazard and unsafe workplace practices. There's no disagreement on that. We all agree on that. But overregulation uh, has a tendency to destroy jobs. Uh, for example, the Department of Health and Human Services, under, under the directive of the National Toxicology Program, has labeled recently styrene uh, as a human carcinogen that causes cancer. Now, styrene uh, is the basic ingredient that is used in plastic composites. Uh, about 90% of the composites contain that, and about 50% of, um, of other plastic, uh, plastic resins uh, for other uses. And some of the uses for products uh, with styrenes, uh, they're used in um, packaging and disposables under uh, polystyrene plastic resins, uh, food trays, egg uh, cartons, furniture, office fixtures, equipment covers, mail trays, uh, in fact, the, the plastic uh, that is oftentimes used on, um, uh, on electronic equipment, uh, refrigerator components, liners, air conditioning parts and housing, uh, toys, um, high-tech products, consumer electronics, major appliances, insulation, uh, floor backing, uh, pipe and siding, computer monitors, um, IV connectors, syringes, stereo covers, you can see that it's, 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 it's almost anything uh, that is used um, in, in manufacturing and uh, the, 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 
The fiberglass tubs, showers. The gentleman would, lay, yes. would yield. I believe this board's made out of that styrene. Could be. Could be. This is a plastic board. Uh, Could be. A pl what could, we call plastic board. Could, could very well and be. If you look at it, it probably is made out of styrene. And so it, it's, that just demonstrates, uh, uh, Judge, the, the fact that, that styrene is, is so pervasive in all of our consumer products. Now, what has happened is the National Toxicology Program uh, said that styrene is a carcinogen. They looked at a couple of studies, did a very, very poor job in looking at the history and the other studies available. In fact, the European Union and Canada came to the opposite conclusion and said that, that uh, there's nothing wrong with styrenes, that it does not cause cancer. What we're trying to do is get the National Academy of Sciences, um, which is widely regarded as a final word in these scientific matters, to conduct an independent study on styrene. Now, if nothing happens and styrene remains on this list of something that's, quote, likely to cause uh, cancer, it could end up destroying hundreds of thousands of jobs in America. Let me give you an example. The company that makes all the plastic utensils for McDonald's, that company uses styrenes. And what we see developing here uh, are insurance companies that are taking a look at the, at the plastic companies that use styrene, and they're becoming very nervous over the fact that the government has taken a position that without good case study, that styrene is a carcinogen. So insurance companies are starting to balk to insure the styrene uh, companies that use styrene. Lawyers have already met uh, examining the best way that they could bring the class action lawsuits uh, for all these uh, products that contain styrenes. And what could end up happening is because of the regulations that will come down from the federal government, the government will say, well, in its fi finished product, there's nothing wrong with a product involving styrenes, but in the manufacturing of it, that's where the problem is. We could lose hundreds of thousands of jobs. Our plastic industry could be destroyed. Now, th these are the types of things that absolutely do not make sense, where because of the, of the jungle of rules uh, that the federal government has that makes it very difficult to get in a counter argument uh, where people make decisions uh, not based upon a cost analysis but based upon a couple of studies here and there as opposed to volumes of studies that have gone on examining whether or not styrenes are carcinogen. We could lose the plastics industry in America. Those jobs could easily go overseas all because of poor science on the part of the regulators. Regulation in America is out of control. And I work not only with the styrene industry, but the people that are involved um, in, in foundries uh, where uh, regulations are underway that if they're not done correctly, I could take a look at the silicas and say, and even though silicas are a problem, we know that if the regulations are done improperly, we could lose the foundry industry in this country. America is great because of our manufacturing background. America will only recover from this economic crisis when the manufacturing jobs are secure and come back. And that's why we've been pleading with HHS. Said, you don't understand, the Department of Health and Human Services, the impact of the poor decision that you have made with regard to these styrenes. And we could go on to other products from other, corp other um, manufacturers. And it's, it's a slew. You have up there in the chart uh, the scissors cutting the red tape. The red tape is so thick, it would take a blowtorch to go through it or some kind of a chopper or, or buzzsaw besides the, the scissor on it. So I, um, I share with you the concern, the deep concern over the people who are losing jobs in America today 
because of overregulation by the federal government. In recapturing my time, I thank my friend and say that I hope that all those members of this House and others that might be listening heard you say America could lose this industry. It didn't say that the world would lose this industry because, quite honestly, once again, a great industry that produces good paying jobs will all of a sudden, not because of taxes or not because of high labor costs, which a lot of the arguments we get, a new factor. The regulatory agency drove this prosperous in, in, industry out of our country because of possibly voodoo science, that they didn't investigate enough. They do, they've got a concept, and they stick to that concept on their science arguments, and they don't, they've got, they don't go outside the, the, the scope of their, their view of the world. And they're going to shut down an industry, but are we going to stop making plastics? No, the world's not. Just Jeez. the United States is going to stop. That's correct. That's correct. And that's why. And then people say, why are all these these jobs offshore? It's not just the cost of labor that drives people offshore. Our regulatory agencies, agencies have as much to do with that as anything there is out there. The president made a joke recently where he said he found out that all shovel-ready jobs are not shovel-ready jobs. Well, let me tell you. I haven't checked all those jobs he's talking about, but I'd be willing to bet you that there's either an endangered species or the, in some form or fashion the Environmental Protection Agency is in between the shovel, taking the first load of dirt on a project, and, and somebody trying to get a project done. Because it's the agencies that are shutting down our highways, they're shutting down our bridges, they're shutting down our sewer projects, our water projects, and sometimes for very bizarre reason. Would the, would the gentleman yield? I certainly do yield back. And, and look at the Keystone Pipeline uh, coming down from uh, Canada uh, to Texas with branches really into, into, into central Illinois. It's been tied up by the, by the EPA and other regulators for three years. We're looking at uh, 20,000 new jobs. Uh, I think it's a five to eight billion dollar project. Uh, that doesn't count the people that make the pizzas, the people that uh, make the, 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 the shoes. Uh, I was talking to a, a shoe salesman, uh, Red Wing Shoes, uh, that are mostly made in America. And he, those are the, the industrial shoes. And I said, how's business? And he said, Don, he said, when manufacturing is down and construction is down, my sales of shoes are down. Sure. And so it's a, uh, uh, it continues. It, it's not just the cost, the actual cost of the impact to that particular um, uh, entity, the particular construction site, the particular regulation, but all the peripherals that come as a result of it, those are the things that destroy our economy. Yeah, you, taking back a little time here, just to, to continue this conversation, I think it's very interesting what you said about the, the pipeline. That pipeline is bringing heavy crude from Canada to the United States to be refined. Now. Let's just point out that it was in the Wall Street Journal less than, less than sometime this week, because I read it this week, that Alberta, Canada is just exploding. Everybody's got these great jobs because they are developing, they're going forward, their environmentalists are staying out of the way, and they're developing this heavy crude industry, this tar they've got up there, these tar sands, and that's what we're shipping down here to be refined in this proposed pipeline down to where the market is in the United States. Well, Canada is one of our largest, if not the largest, single exporter to the United States of petroleum products. Now, what's interesting about this picture is that same field that's across that imaginary line in Canada is also down in North Dakota, and we know it's there. It's in Montana, and we know it's there. And it's probably in a lot of other places that are called, quote, public lands in this country right now. Those are lands held by the federal government. They own those lands. Now, what does that mean? That means that they're not letting the drilling going on or the exploration go on our land for the same petroleum products that we're buying from Canada and building a ship, a pipeline to ship down here. Why? EPA and others. Regulators 
and bureaucrats are preventing the development of those products. Now, it all goes back to the global warming or climate change argument or all whatever, whatever this whole big umbrella that is over this whole, whole idea. But you wonder why there's no jobs. 250,000 jobs have been created in Alberta, Canada in the last 18 months. 250,000 jobs, all doing with that oil. Right across the border, we could be doing the same thing. And it's not just oil, it's, it's natural gas. Natural gas, it's natural gas. And I'll tell you something else. I was just down in San Antonio meeting with some uh, friends down there where I was a banker. He said, go to South Texas, man. You should see what's happening in South Texas. They have found that there's, besides the oil and gas we'd already found many years ago down there, they have now found out that the shale oil, there's shale oil and shale gas down the ground, amazing deposits down there. They're going to have to be using the fracking system to get it out. But already they're building hotels in towns that only have 8,000 people in them. They're building four-story hotels. Why? Because the foreseeable future, working men and women are going to be in those hotels because they've got a job there until they can find a place to live. Builders are already looking at, what, at developing subdivisions. And everyone, the people who are selling work books, boots are selling work boots in South Texas. And all those periphery things that come off of that discovery and that development of that discovery creates thousands and thousands of jobs. It multiplies as it goes, just exactly as you were, uh, as you were describing, Mr. Manzillo. And, and that's the exact kind of progression that will bring this country back if, our, if we let those folks continue to manufacture. And the new product, I guarantee you, there's not a person that's watching this or listening to this or is in this chamber that there's not somewhere almost within their reach something that's made out of the styrene that you've just been describing to us. It is almost as, as abundant as wood. In fact, if you remember the old movie, uh, the graduate, what was it he said? The, the guy gave the kid, it's plastic. That's the future, plastic. Well, we're in that future now. And it is, it is the future. In fact, one of the reasons our, we have such an outstanding medical world that we live in is we're not having to rewash and sterilize metal and glass instruments. We're, we're making these, all of our instruments out of this plastic with that styrene in it, and then we're throwing them away. They're disposable. We can make them at a price that we can dispose of them for health purposes, which has changed the lives of many thousands and thousands of Americans in this country every single day. The health pluses of having that product on the market. But with the government's interference, we'll be getting it from China or India or, or who knows where, but it won't be from here. And no American will have a good job on that. It's, it's almost criminal. Plus, we, back. Well, plus we, would, we would end up losing uh, the people that made the, the machine tools, uh, the, mold, the actual molds, the dyes uh, for the injection systems and other types of systems uh, and molding systems that are used um, in the manufacture of these plastics. But I appreciate the, uh, Congressman Carter yielding to me for a few minutes to, uh, to explain the styrene issue and look forward to the rest of your presentation. Well, thank you. I thank you for joining me. And if you'd like to stay, we'd love to have you. Going back to another quote, CNBC CEO, from a regulation standpoint, government just needs to get out of the way. We asked several CEOs leading up to the speech what bold steps Obama could take to reduce the 9.1% unemployment rate John Schiller, chairman and CEO of Energy 21, said if the government would get out of the way from a regulation standpoint and let us, 21, do what we uh, do good, you'll see us continue to hire and grow this economy. I think that's the message from across the board, said Schiller. From the Washington Examiner, if President Obama was serious about boosting job creation, he would stop his administration from creating even more regulatory uncertainty. This is the president who once blithely quirped, you know, the business community always complain, is always complaining about regulations. 
But Friday's decision can only be viewed possibly if it is indeed a first step. There are still six other proposed regulations from the EPA that would cost the economy dearly. According to the EPA's own estimates, the cost to small business, business for obtaining carbon emissions permits alone would be $76 billion per year, not including the hundreds of billions of dollars in widespread economic damage from higher energy prices. If Obama really wanted to remove regulatory uncertainty from the economy, he would use his Thursday job speech, that was last Thursday, to announce that he is ordering the EPA Administrator, Lisa Jackson, to halt all her agency's work on global warming regulations. Now, these are just some quotes from some of the media out there that are talking about job creation. I'm for a moratorium. We'll see if we can get that done. Red tape reality. The White House promises to save $10 billion in five years. The White House just put forward $17.7 billion in regulations in only, 17, in only two months. Next one. Thank you. This is um, something we call the Train Act. What the, the purpose of the Train Act is very simple. Transparency and regulatory analysis of impacts on the nation, trains. These guys sit up late at night to figure out that, how they can have an, an acronym to cover whatever they're doing. But this is very simple. Train dele delays Boilermac and Caspar, these are two huge rulemaking issues, which we'll talk about. I'll tell you about in just a minute. Until the full impact of the Obama administration's regulatory agenda has been studied. They basically say a thousand power plants are expected to be affected. The annual electricity bill increases in many parts of the country from 12 to 24 percent. Now what is this? The administration's new maximum achievable control technology standards and cross-state air pollution rule for utility plants will affect electricity price prices for nearly all American consumers. A total of 1,000 plants are expected to be affected. Middle-class Americans can expect their bill to go up between 12 and 22 percent. Mr. Sullivan is saying, look, let's make an economic analysis before you actually impose these regulations see what it's actually going to do, how is it going to hurt the individual consumer, and how, how, by the way, is it going to hurt the ability of people to get a job? If you're going to shut down, in some instances, up to a third to a half of power plants, because they're either coal emission power plants or because they, they, they've got boiler issues that have got to be de dealt with, then what happens? You're talking about people's jobs getting laid off. Those, you know, there's some, that, when it comes to coal-powered plants, there's some places where the majority of the electricity in the Midwest, for instance, is coal-powered. Now, if you're going to shut down coal-powered plants to make them retool for new regulations, which, here's an interesting thought, they've already retooled and put scrubbers on these things three or four times. It's another set of retooling on top of the retooling before the retooling and the other retooling. Then they get, and when they get to this thing and they get finally, at some point, the guy's going to say, my gosh, I think I've had about all this regulation I can stand. Now, I'm going to tell you an amusing story, but it's true. When I was a young lawyer, I worked for the Agriculture Committee of the Texas House of Representatives as their lawyer. Uh, and uh, we had a hearing one day about new federal regulations on sausage manufacture. Now, Texas is, uh, our heritage has a lot of folks from the sausage manufacturing parts of Europe. We have Germans, we have Czechs, we have Swedes. 
Uh, we have Norwegians. We have a lot of people who, in their old country, they made sausage. And so we have lots and lots of small sausage operations in Texas. Almost every town you go to in Texas, some butcher shop somewhere is making their own best sausage made in Texas. And it, you can go to our grocery store and you'll see sausage that's produced. I'm just talking about Texas now. In multiple cities all over the states. Most of them are small towns. Now, this is a true story. We have, we're having a testimony about new government regulations concerning the manufacture of sausage by small businesses. And they brought a man in who was in a prison uniform from the state prison in Huntsville. And they put him on the stand and they said, why are you here? He said, well, my brother and I, we, had, we made the best, best sausage in East Texas. But we got this guy, with this guy came in our office and he said, I got these regulations here. You're not going to be able to make this in your butcher shop anymore. You're going to have to redo your butcher shop. They gave us a list of stuff we had to do. We took it to our banker. He said, you boys got the best sausage operation in East Texas. I'll loan you $25,000. You can do the, fix your place up. So they put in tile floors with drains, and they put in different butcher blocks and this, that, and the other. And he said, nah, we, we borrowed $25,000, and he said about eight months later, that same old boy came through the door. He said, I got some bad news for you, gentlemen. We got new regulations. All that stuff you had to do last time, it's not good enough. Everything's got to be stainless steel. You got to have a cement floor with a power drain in it. You got to have certain kinds of saws. And, Said, so me and my brother, we went to the banker and we said, hey, what are we going to do? He said, well, that's another 50000 but you're good. You got a great business. I'm going to loan you that $50,000. You boys do the work. So we did the work. And it was working great. We were manufacturing sausages. We still made the best sausages in East Texas. He said, and then that same old boy came walking in our door and he said, I got bad news for you, boys. He said, and that's when I shot him. Now, that's a true story. And he was serving time for manslaughter in a penitentiary for shooting that regulator. I'm not, I'm not in any way advocating shooting regulators. I'm telling you how frustrated a small businessman can get just for regulations on the manufacture of sausage in his hometown butcher shop. Now think how, how, how frustrated that an employer gets when a regulation causes him to lay off one-third of his workforce to afford to do what he's doing. Uh, this, is the, this is the whole concept of why regulations are so, have to be so carefully planned and done. And you have to have good studies done as to the economic effect. As John Sullivan, from Oklahoma, my friend from Oklahoma, has brought before this house. 